Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to start by uh, thanking uh, Vadim Ivanov, Viktor Zetlin, and uh, Alexander Vatilevsky for organizing this meeting. And I'm, I'm glad and I'm honored to take part here in this meeting to honor the memory of Yevgeny Grishin. We are now slightly changing the topic a bit, moving away from, from toxins to human diseases of the brain. And what I would like to present within the next 20, 30 minutes or so is to uh, summarize some, some evidence that sporadic Alzheimer's disease, and I have to emphasize I'm talking about sporadic Alzheimer's disease, not about the familiar form of the disease, that sporadic Alzheimer's disease might well be an interesting topic for developmental and evolutionary biologists. I would like to I would like to start by summarizing some evidence that Alzheimer's disease is a disorder which is specific to human, and it does not occur in, in animals. There are a couple of arguments listed, listed here on this slide that Alzheimer's disease affects, so it's a kind of functional argument, it affects the higher faculties of human, which are specific to human, such as higher mental cognitive functions, language, reasoning, self-awareness, and so on. Further, there is, is hardly any equivalent in the animal world of the disease. Uh, there is no uh, Alzheimer type pathology in non-primate mammals, and even primates, non-human primates, hardly develop the full-blown picture of Alzheimer's disease. So it's a disease which is specific to human. There are other arguments such as molecular facts that one of the major risk factors of the disease, such as the A2E polymorphism, is unique to human. And there are more structural arguments, both with respect to brain development and phylogeny, uh, such as that neurofibrillary degeneration, which is the major hallmark of the disease, uh, typically affects brain areas. <coughs> which have been acquired and developed only during very late hominid evolution. So this is illustrated in the next slide here. I'm not so familiar how to... Okay. Now coming again to the, to the, to the functional argument that it affects the higher faculties um, of human. On the left side, you see the scale and the sequence at which functions acquired during human development, according to Piaget. So very early, very, very early during human development, um, the, the baby already develops the ability to hold up the head, to smile, so very basic uh, means of, of communication, which in Alzheimer's disease uh, remain until the very late stages. So that means you have this sequence, how you acquire functional abilities during childhood and in adolescence, and you lose these abilities in the reverse order of the acquirement. So you initially, at early Alzheimer's disease, you lose the most highly developed mental abilities acquired most lately during human uh, development, during adolescence, and those abilities which are acquired most early, uh, stay until most developed stages of Alzheimer's disease. This is called the cognitive developmental approach to dementia, and it illustrates that there is a functional, uh, a functional hierarchy with respect. It's my time's over. <laughs> <laughs> no, clearly not. And the next. Now the second aspect is that the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, in particular the neurofibrillar pathology, is not homogeneously distributed throughout the human brain. It starts at certain uh, circumscribed areas such as the endorhinal and transendorhinal cortex, 
basically the limbic cortex, and then it develops, it spreads uh, in a fairly systematic way, firstly to non-primary association cortex, to primary association cortex, and only it eventually reaches the primary sensory and motor cortex. And this is exactly the reverse order of, the of development and maturation of these, of these brain structures. So that means the disease starts at area which develop very lately during urine development, which mature very lately, and only at very late stages, the degeneration reaches area which mature very early during development. So this is a developmental aspect of the disease. However, there is another more phylogenetic evolutionary dimension to the disease in the way that it affects both brain structures as well as molecules and uh, molecular networks which have only evolved during very recent hominid evolution. And this slide here summarizes the result of a genome-wide transcriptome study we have performed analyzing both uh, protein coding and non-protein coding sequences in the transcriptome and then looking for changes in conservation of gene structures analyzing splice sites. And what you can see here, this, this scale down here, this is the phylogenetic distance from humans, and these are basically the primates, and these are lower <coughs> non-primate mammals here. So that is, that is in this time, that's the human here, and this is most far away from the human. Now you can see here there is an increase in the conservation rate in the genome, this is the background level, this is the gray line here, there is an increase to human. And if you only look at the Alzheimer's disease associated <coughs> genes, they are below the background. And this applies both to the long non-coding as well as to the protein coding sequences, which indicates that there is an accelerated evolution of those genes which show changes in their expression in Alzheimer's disease. So this means that gene expression in Alzheimer's disease is, has a, a, a human-specific aspect. And I think this is a very strong argument that something which had occurred during very recent hominid evolution might indeed be relevant to the pathogenesis of the disease. So the question is, why do we get Alzheimer's disease? And the quick answer would be because we have such a big brain. And this brain has evolved in the recent hominid evolution over the last 10 million years or so, with an enormous increase in brain volume, enabling a higher cognitive capacity by increased number of cortical synapses and an increased brain plasticity. Again, if we compare the brain areas which are affected by the disease most early and most constantly, uh, it becomes apparent that these are the same areas which have evolved only during recent hominid evolution. And this is basically shown here. Again, this is a kind of, of, of heat map here um, of the intensity of vulnerability against neurofibrillary degeneration. So brain areas such as the temporal cortex to some extent also the, the frontal cortex is affected most severely and most early, while other areas which are shown in more uh, in, in blue here, such as the motor cortex, parieto-occipital cortex, um, shows only degeneration at most advanced stages. Now, if we look at this heat map here, this shows the cortical expansion in hominid evolution comparing monkey to human brain. We again see that brain areas such as the temporal cortex, the frontal cortex, have increased in volume most dramatically while the motor cortex and the occipital cortex have decelerated. So this is, in a way, matching what we see with respect to the pattern of neurofibrillary degeneration in the disease. Now the question is, if indeed uh, brain development, brain evolution, and growth in brain volume might be related to Alzheimer's disease, is the question, what mechanisms are responsible, um, how nature makes a bigger brain? And the first thing, the first answer to this question is, 
It is made through an extended duration of the cell cycle and by more total rounds of cell division. This is shown here on the right side, comparing brain development in mouse and monkey. And what you see here, this is the number of cell cycles. So it comes at no surprise that in the monkey brain, you have more, much more than twice the numbers of cell cycles you need to make for a mouse brain. And in addition to it, if you look at the embryonic stage where the cell cycle uh, is active, you realize it is a very short duration only in mouse brain where you have a much longer period of cell division of progenitor cells in the monkey brain. So this is not only then a mechanism which uh, probably is prone to errors in cell division, it's also a more longer period during pregnancy where exogenous toxic factors can affect the cell cycle machinery. So if this relates to uh, the disease, one might need to, to think about uh, whether, whether cell division and mechanisms of cell cycle regulation have anything to do with Alzheimer's disease. And again, coming back to the genome-wide transcriptome study I, I showed you earlier, this is again just a summary. Up here you see across the different chromosomes the number of changes in the protein coding regions. These are the intergenic regions, these are the intronic regions, and you can appreciate apparently that both the intergenic and intronic regions are affected are affected to about the same extent of the protein coding regions. If you do an enrichment analysis, uh, you come up with a number of, of um, domains which are affected here, and some of the domains which are affected most prominently are in fact really cell cycle regulating aspects. This is shown down here. Now coming back to the Alzheimer brain, this shows you an immunohistochemical preparation of an Alzheimer brain in pyramidal cells, which are those cells which typically undergo neurofibrillar degeneration. You do see an upregulation, a re-expression of cell cycle markers. So this is the cell cycle in a neuron which is postmitotically fixed. You would usually assume that this is in the GO stage, which is here. Then you here you have the DNA replication phase, which is the S phase, this is the mitotic phase, and in between you have a gap one and a gap two phase. And each of these phase in the dividing, normal dividing cycling cell is characterized by upregulation of a typical marker, such as cycling dependent kinase four, which is a typical marker of early G1 phase, cycling DP, and, and so on and so forth. And also these cells are post-mitotic in the adult human brain. You do find an upregulation of these cell cycle markers here, such as CDK4, cycle D, B16. Whatever you look for, you will find an upregulation of those markers, which are commonly believed to indicate the activation of the cycle, which is quite, which is quite strange to extend. Again, if one then looks at uh, indications of DNA replication and number of uh, chromosomes, um, you will find that there is quite a high frequency of cells, of neurons, I have to say, in the human brain, which deviate with respect to DNA content from the dip diploid level of DNA. And this is shown here with a few examples for chromosomal hybridization. This is chromosome 17, this is chromosome 7, and this is a diploid uh, cell here, diploid pyramidal cell. This is a tetraploid. So you have four, four copies of chromosome 17, again shown here. <coughs> this shows three copies of chromosome 7, and I hope you can see this is a bit dark here. Here you see side by side a diploid cell, a triploid cell, and a tetraploid cell, which means, in fact, that the human brain is a mosaic. It's a somatic mosaic containing uh, a variety of neurons, which each, each neuron probably being uh, individually different <coughs> from other cells with respect to DNA content. 
Now, this is, this is indeed not such a new finding, and there have been reports <coughs> by a Russian colleague, Brodsky, in the late 50s, uh, already working on this aspect of aneuploidy and polyploidy of the human brain. There are a couple of other colleagues, also from, from Russia, reporting similar findings in the, in the 60s. Unfortunately, uh, the publications are all in Russian, and the, and the Western world didn't, didn't realize this until, for some reason, an American guy called Lapham published the same finding in science quite a few years, years later only. 68 had two publications in science. And then it started a hype, really, throughout uh, many, many laboratories in the 60s and 70s, uh, looking at different types of neurons, such as Fokinia cells, uh, hippocampal cells, cortical cells, different species, and suddenly scientists recognize that there are numerous polyploid and aneuploid neurons in the brain. And there was, at some stage, there was a belief that perhaps even all, all the neurons are polyploid. However, a bit, a bit later, there occurred some concern about the techniques, techniques at, those, at those days, which were um, not very, uh, very re re reproducible. And eventually, in the, in the mid-late mid 80s, um, it was believed to be an artifact. So only more recently, um, a couple of labs, including our own, rediscovered this with a number of new techniques. And this is another technique here, slide-based cytometry, and this is PCR amplification. I wonder how much time do I have? Okay, now uh, hyperploidy is an early event. It's a preclinical event, and I show you this in the next slide here. These are, this is disease progression of Alzheimer's disease. These are control brains here. This is the number of hyperploid neurons. And this is preclinic AD, the green, the green symbols, and you have here the orange symbols. This is early AD, mild cognitive impairment, and this is severe AD. So you have already an upregulation here with respect to the frequency of hyperploid neurons at the preclinical stage and only at some stage here where, which might require perhaps some external trigger also, you have then the, the progression of a decrease in the number and the progressive loss of these neurons, which I think indicates that you can cope for, to some extent with, with the increased frequency of hyperploid neurons. But uh, under certain circumstances, it, uh, it, it triggers the, the cell death of these neurons for what, what reason ever. And this is shown here again. This is the endorhinal cortex. Uh, these are 28 cases. And if you summarize uh, the, the quantitative morphology of all these 28 cases, in this case, you have here a total loss of 67 neurons. And out of these 60, 67 neurons, there is a loss of diploid neurons with respect to seven cells, but the majority of cells which are lost here in the endorhinal <coughs> cortex, 60 cells, which means 90% are hyperploid neurons, which means the hyperploidy is a kind of marker of neuronal vulnerability of those cells which are prone to cell death. And again, this also matches the distribution of hyperploid and aneuploid neurons in the human brain also matches this pattern I showed you earlier with respect to regional differences in vulnerability. So as there are certain brain areas such as the endorhinal cortex, which is affected most early, most severely, and on the other end of the scale, you have the parietal and occipital cortex. And this matches with respect to the frequency of neurons you already find in the normal human brain of hyperploid neurons here. So you have much more hyperploid neurons in the endorhinal cortex already in the normal human brain than you do have in the occipital cortex. Um, now the question is, is this increased frequency of aneuploid and hyperploid neurons a result of an activation of the cell cycle in the adult human brain, or is it perhaps 
a result of a mitotic failure during brain development. And this is difficult to answer. The first idea was, as we did observe this increase in cell cycle markers in Alzheimer's brain, we saw, well, there might be a direct link of this increase, and there might in be, indeed be an ongoing DNA replication in these neurons. However, if you look at different animals, uh, you do see a similar upregulation of cell cycle markers, and then we did some tissue culture work, and we did realize that a number of these cell cycle regulators, which are in dividing cells, are really the regulators of the cell cycle, can subserve alternative functions in a differentiated cell. This is shown here. This first shows you the constitutive expression of the CDK4, for example, in mice neurons, cycling B. So it's not in the neuron where you would expect it to be in a cycling cell, it's in the cytoplasm. It shows an external localization, it's localized, uh, it's attached to microtubules probably. And if you downregulate the CDK4 by siRNA, for example, you get an outgrow of mungrides. So you get an increase in your structure or neuronal plasticity, that's shown here. Which means that those molecules which can regulate the cycle in a dividing cell apparently regulate structural plasticity in a differentiated cell. So this creates doubts, of course, that this activation of the cell cycle markers are related to the aneuploid phenomenon in the Alzheimer's brain. And at this stage, we came across uh, a, a concept which was developed in the early 80s that brain shrinkage you do see of an Alzheimer's disease. This is, this, is, this is a normal human brain, that's an Alzheimer's brain, and what you, what you see with the naked eye here, you have a massive shrinkage in the surface uh, of the cerebral cortex. However, if you do a quantitative study on the size of the cortex, it's not so much a shrinkage in the thickness of the cortex, rather than in the overall surface, so it, basically in the length of the cortex. <coughs> so the concept was put forward that what you, what you really do observe is a loss of structural elements, such as columns maybe in the cortex, and then you have a shrinkage in the cortical, in the cortical surface. Mm. And this matches with another observation we, we made um, recently, that a number of markers of pathology, such as certain kind of neurofibrillar degeneration here, picked up with a specific antibody, is really organized in a, in a columnar fashion. So this is, this is just the cortex, this is the surface, that's the white metal down here, and you can see that neurons which are affected really align in a kind of columnar structure. Right? And that would be some, some kind of argument that indeed the columnar organization of the cortex, which is basically a reflection of the ontogeny of the cortex. As you know, there are the, the precursor cells of the cortex which develop here in the ventricular zone, and then by asymmetrical division, they send out water cells which align in this columnar fashion here, which means that the whole column is basically clonally related to the precursor cell. So if you would assume that something happens with cell cycle regulation, with mitotic regulation in the precursor cell, you probably would find the sequel of this, of this change here within a column. And I think that the columnar organization of the pathology we observed is, is indeed an indication that this might, this might play a role in the pathology. There are other indications by other groups that the pathology in Alzheimer's disease occurs very early, and this is just a picture taken from a publication by Heiko Prag, where, where he analyzed in 2,600 cases the distribution uh, of early tau pathology and what you can see here is the age plot between zero and 100 years of age. And what he found is the tau pathology 
which is potentially, but it's not clear whether this is really an initial change of the pathology, but you can pick it up with antibodies and with structural mm -hmm. measures which are typical for the pathology occurs uh, according to his finding at an age already below 10 years of age. If you extend this line of regression here, you will see that uh, statistically there is already some presence of these changes already at birth. And it could be that the pathology he observes is not related to Alzheimer's pathology, it could be reversible, but it's also possible that this, what he observes, is already an initial sign of the pathology uh, many, many years before the clinical symptoms occur. And I think this is also another argument that we really have to consider that sporadic Alzheimer's disease could have a developmental origin. I'm closing by thanking my collaborators and making tribute to the families of our patients. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.